Hey, welcome to this episode of the Bone Coach Show dedicated to helping you understand all things related to diet, lifestyle, bone health, and how you can live and thrive with low bone density and osteoporosis. I'm your bone coach, Kevin Ellis, certified health coach, health and wellness speaker, and above all else, your bone coach. After being diagnosed with osteoporosis in my early 30s, I transformed my health through diet and lifestyle and now help my clients and community members do the same through my online coaching practice, bonecoach.com. Look, there are no quick and easy cures for low bone density, but the choices we make every single day have a powerful impact on our bones, our health, and our general well-being. I'll share the research, interview the experts, and help you get the conditions right in your body so you can better your bones through diet and lifestyle. Short disclaimer, I'm not a medical doctor. This show should not be considered medical advice. Also, before we even get into the episode, I want you to do two things. If you haven't done so already, punch that subscribe button and that little bell next to it so you get notified every time I put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, I want you to go right below this video and there's a link to head over to bonecoach.com and sign up for the free seven day osteoporosis kickstart guide. It's gonna tell you everything you need step by step over the next seven days to help you start building stronger bones right now. So go ahead and pause the video, do that, and I'll meet you back here in just a minute for this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Want to know how to prevent fracture through safe exercise? Want to know what exercises build bone, which ones don't, and which ones can lead to injury? The answers might surprise you. Want to know if yoga and Pilates should be a part of your osteoporosis and bone building plan? This episode is going to tell you exactly that. So you're going to want to stay to the end. In this episode, I'll be interviewing Dr. Sherry Betts. She's a doctor of physical therapy, a Pilates instructor with extensive work in the field of geriatric orthopedics, safe yoga, and Pilates-based exercise. She served on the Foundation for Osteoporosis Research and Education Professional Education Committee and the National Osteoporosis Foundation Exercise and Rehabilitation Advisory Council. She's the director of a group of physical therapy clinics called Therapilates, and that specialize in safe geriatric exercise and orthopedic rehabilitation in both Santa Cruz, California and Monroe, Louisiana. Her focus and passion are in helping people with osteoporosis develop safe, effective exercise routines using Pilates, yoga, physical therapy, and more. That's why I'm so excited for you to see this episode and hear it because I think you're going to learn so much inside of it. So Dr. Betts, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you about my favorite topic. Good, good. Well, so, so before you actually became a, a doctor of physical therapy, Sherry actually started out as her, her career as a national gymnastics competitor, group fitness instructor, a personal trainer. And, you know, I really wanted to understand how did your work evolve into working with people to improve their bone health, especially through safe exercise, physical therapy, Pilates and yoga and things like that. And I'd love if you could just share that with our audience. Yeah, the, the way I got inspired to become a physical therapist or even an exercise person was um, dealing with injuries in gymnastics and then wanting to stay in shape after retiring from gymnastics from a foot injury. And then when I went to Colorado to teach at Nautilus Fitness Centers, I was, wanted to go to college there and kind of went there as a young girl right out of high school and uh, started to work for Nautilus Fitness Centers and was trained by an exercise physiologist there that said, you need to do this work. You love this. You're good at this. You know, he inspired me to, to pursue it. And then there was a physical therapist in an office next door to the healthcare facility that was so intriguing to me. I just wanted to soak up all his knowledge and learn everything that he was doing with patients. And when patients would get discharged, he would send them over to us and tell us their parameters and give us recommendations for exercise for them. And we would take them through an exercise routine. So this is back in the 90s when personal trainers made about 5.25 an hour. And um, <laughs> so I was teaching uh, glutes classes and aerobics, high impact aerobics classes and step classes were starting to get popular back then. So I'm like a dinosaur in the industry. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, um, I really got inspired to become a physical therapist. So I started pursue, to pursue my degree in PT 
ended up coming back to my home state of Louisiana because I could get in sooner, I could get the prerequisites sooner and be an in-state resident there. So I went ahead and applied at LSU and went to LSU Medical Center in the Shreveport campus and graduated from PT school in 1991. Um, so I practiced as an outpatient therapist, worked treating backs and necks and shoulders and knees and mostly orthopedic conditions, some neuro cases, but mostly orthopedics was my love. And then I um, went to do traveling healthcare for a little while. And I'd always dreamed of doing that. And um, I went all over the country doing traveling healthcare. And I ended up in a lot of nursing homes where people were in there because they had had a, a hip fracture and they never regained their prior status. So once they had the hip fracture, they couldn't live on their own, they couldn't be independent, they lost their independence and had to go into a nursing home environment or an assisted living environment. So I was working in those environments, mostly getting people out of bed, trying to get them to walk, trying to get them uh, to stay on their feet, get on their feet, get them stronger, keep them mobile as much as possible. And I realized how many people had hip fractures. Then I had a colleague uh, that I met. Um, I took a director position at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital in Hamilton, New Jersey. And um, I met a woman there that was an OBGYN nurse who had had a neck injury and a back injury from a car accident. She had a pelvic girdle rotation, um, things like that. And she just had all kinds of multiple comorbidities. So um, she was very excited about her, the progress that she made with physical therapy, working with me. And then uh, she invited me to come and speak to her group that she was working with once a week. She had a women's wellness program that was under the umbrella of um, OBGYN. And she was focusing on osteoporosis, back in 1995 so she was quite at the forefront of that whole wave and educating people on what they could do safely to uh, prevent bone loss and to build bone density so that included nutrition uh, supplements um, homeopathy uh, pharmacology she'd have pharmacists come in formulary pharmacists doing more natural remedies for or estrogen and hormone replacement, things like that. So she invited me to come in and do the exercise portion of her program and I joined her full time. I quit my job and joined her full time doing the women's wellness program. So that was just amazing. And that's where I really got my start in working with osteoporosis. There was nobody out there doing any education on osteoporosis at the time. And I took a couple of courses from colleagues, Kathy Ship from Duke University, did a, did a course back then on osteoporosis and exercise, and Sarah Meeks did a course on osteoporosis and exercise. So those are the only people doing anything with it. And I wanted to focus on the, the yoga aspect of it, and I had become interested in Pilates and wanted to, to, to focus on the Pilates aspect of it too. So that's kind of how I got into all this. <laughs> No, no, that's an amazing backstory yeah. too. So, and, and what's interesting is you were really in the trenches of, of working with people that had been in really unfortunate circumstances, especially, you know, fracturing hips, um, having some other things that they had to work through and you really helped get them to a point where uh, they were in a better state, which uh, I'm sure was difficult at the time, but um, I'm curious now. So now that you're working specifically with Pilates and yoga, a lot of people hear that when they first start, especially when they're newly diagnosed and they're kind of trying to piece together the pieces of, okay, this sounds like something I could incorporate. This sounds like something I should bring in, but they just don't know how to do it or they might not even be familiar with it. So what, is, what are yoga and Pilates for people who might not even know? Right, right. Yoga is a very old form of exercise that is actually um, a branch of the Hindu religion. So it's more of a spiritual practice and it's a movement practice as well. So it does have that spiritual component to it. Um, it is usually, I talk about the differences in the physical aspects of yoga and Pilates, the, in that yoga holds postures at end range for long periods of time, generally. Um, there are certain styles like the vinyasa flow style that is more of a flowing style where you don't hold postures at end range for long periods of time. Um, you won't find that in Pilates. Pilates is a, a, a system of exercise developed by Joseph Pilates back in the early 20s when he moved to United States from Germany. 
and he was very interested in health and fitness, spine mobility, and posture. He wanted all of his exercises to improve everyday life and posture. So he was very interested in functional and um, applications to daily life. So um, that being said, his program doesn't hold positions. There's no static stretching in Pilates. And there's just a flowing movement that your goal is to flow from one exercise to the next and never stop moving throughout the whole session. That's the goal. Now that's not how you start it necessarily. You might rest between exercises as you're a beginner, but the goal is to flow from one to the next. And that to me makes it so great as a dovetail with uh, neurological information that we're learning now. The nervous system does much better with neurological conditions like sciatica or carpal tunnel or some of those radiating uh, syn nerve pain syndromes that Pilates does really well with that because you don't take the body to end range. You start with small movements in mid range or, or um, closed range and then progressively make the movements larger as you gain control. So I feel like the Pilates practice is so good to inform a yoga practice and to um, incorporate a little bit more safety with the yoga practice instead of going straight out to end range before you have really good control of your center. So I hope no, that, that, that helps to- uh, <laughs> No, that absolutely does. So, so you would lean, for somebody especially just starting out, would you lean more toward Pilates just starting out? Well, I look at the client in front of me and if they are hypermobile, definitely start with Pilates. So people that are very hypermobile that tend to have too much range of motion in their joints, I would definitely start with Pilates. And then um, people that are very stiff or have a lot of uh, difficulty with moving, um, stiff muscles, and um, I might push them more toward yoga. Even though the core control aspects of Pilates I'll always incorporate with people. I want them to have good pelvic stability and core control so that they can move their limbs without torquing their back, right? And without sure. you know, feeling like the tail's wagging the dog <laughs> instead of the dog wagging the tail. And, and when someone is, is starting out, you know, if they, if they decide to take on yoga or Pilates, could you kind of, kind of walk them through... Uh, what a basic session might look like even when, when they are starting. Yes. Well, yes. With, with me as a physical therapist, I'm going to do a physical therapy evaluation. If I get somebody in front of me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm going to assess them from head to toe. So I start with the feet, looking at do they pronate or supinate in their feet. Um, that's going to create issues up the kinetic chain if they don't have good control of their feet. That's also going to uh, affect balance. So I look at feet posture. I look at um, the ability to stand with your feet close together, one foot maybe in front of the other, tandem stance, and then single leg stance. That's gonna be a, a, a must with every client that I see. And then looking at leg strength, um, hip mobility, can they do a full squat? Can they pick something off the floor? Functional tasks like that are gonna be a, a prerequisite and something I always look at. And then can they hinge at the hips without uh, bending at their spine? That's gonna be very important for protecting their bones from fracture. Um, and looking at thoracic mobility often is um, a key into, in my programs. So, oh, I, yeah. I think you're highlighting some really important things that people might not understand. Um, Cause uh, you know, when you get a lot of information, sometimes you just wanna act on it because you think it might right. lead to the outcome that you want but sometimes that could be the wrong decision. And that's one of the things I, I try to encourage my audience to do is find the people that know, you know, that like you're talking about, uh, this is highly individual. You don't just want to start doing things because you may have uh, something going on physically that needs to be corrected for and adjusted for. Right. Because right. if somebody has back pain, they got to deal with that before they can start loading their bones. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know what, um, Kevin, let's break for just a second. I want to plug my uh, phone in because it's about to die. <laughs> sure. Let, let's pause. So let's, let's do that. Um, let me let get me, my, um... So Sherry, could you share with me um, what it would look like if somebody were to try to build a safe exercise routine for their specific body? Like what are the steps that they need to be taking to make sure that what they're doing is not going to lead to an injury or a fracture that could have been prevented? Right. Um, I think the most vulnerable areas of the, of the bones in people's bodies are the spinal vertebrae and the hip. 
So spinal vertebrae can fracture with sneezing, coughing, bending over with a rounded back, lifting something up off the floor with a rounded spine. Um, spontaneous fractures can occur, of course. But um, what we wanna do is try to teach people immediately the first concept is to protect your spine from fracture. The next concept is fall prevention. And that, uh, that's how hips fracture. Hips don't fracture unless they fall. And falling from a standing height or lower out of a chair or from a standing height or lower, not off of a roof or having a ski accident or car accident, but if you fall from a standing height and have a fracture, you have osteoporosis. That is, people say, oh, well, it was a hard surface. Now, a kid can fall down onto their hip directly and they will not have a fracture. A 30 year old without osteoporosis obviously can fall down onto their hip directly and not have a fracture. So if you fall and have any fracture at all from a standing height, that is what we call the clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis. So I want people to understand that, that they need to start taking care of their bones if they have any kind of a spontaneous fracture or a fracture from a standing height or less. Um, so that's the two most important concepts, again, spine protection and fall prevention. And then the next concept is leg strengthening. People lose about 1% of their leg strength every year after age 50. So we start to decline. Now, if we exercise and progress our exercise, you can't just do the same thing over and over again. So if you did the vinyasa flow sequence the same way for 20 years, you will gradually decline in your strength. Same with Pilates mat work. If you just did a Pilates mat class, start to finish the same way every time with the 34 exercises from return to life as the protocol, you will slowly decline because you have to challenge yourself. I always tell people, if you're not progressing, you're regressing. So you always have to continue to challenge yourself. You may not always be able to lift hundred pounds, but you're trying to do so. And the way you figure that out is you determine how many reps that you can do with a certain amount of weight. And that's creating that one repetition max for each person. So you, Put a box down in front of people, have them lift it, see if they can lift it at least 10 times. If they cannot lift it 10 times with good form and alignment of their spine especially, then they shouldn't be lifting that much weight. So they need to drop it down and do a, 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 an amount of weight that they can do at least 15 times, 10 to 15 times. Once you get up to the point where you can do 15 or 20, it's too easy and you need to add more weight. So you keep challenging that resistance so that you build muscle and bone because what builds muscle strength also builds bone. And so it's the same concept for building strength. If you're doing 20 to 30 reps of something, you're building endurance. So that concept needs to be explained to everyone and hopefully they can understand that and you can assign the number of reps and figure out the amount of weight that people should be using. Um, so that's one of the first things I teach is how to lift something off the floor without bending your spine. Now, if you're too weak to even come down and touch the floor, um, I think I have enough room back here I can show you. So if you can sit down, come down like this, touch the floor with your spine straight, then you could likely start to add weight and lift a box off the floor. I want people to be able to lift at least 50 pounds so that they can pick up their suitcase and travel to Europe when the quarantine is lifted. <laughs> so I want people to be able to pick up their own suitcase and put it onto the scales at the airport and take care of their own suitcase. And don't get someone else to always be lifting things for you unless you're not lifting it correctly. Um, so that's something I teach the very first lesson is lifting and the concept of how to strength train. Um, and then we go to the fall prevention, fracture, you know, fracture prevention through fall prevention, starting with feet together, narrowing the base of support, standing on one leg. Everyone gets heel raises standing on one leg. That's one of my favorite exercises. The calf is like the second heart and it returns the blood to your head. So if you have swelling in your feet, you've been sitting too much, if you get those calves pumping, that will help pump the blood out of your feet to your heart. So with neuropathy, things like that, we use dowels, we use things to, to press down on, and we determine how much assistance you need. So if you can only do three, you might need to stand against a door frame and then hold two dowels and push down on something or push down on your kitchen cabinet or lean forward a little bit to do your calf raises. 
Um, so those are some of the first things I would do. And then lastly, the next most important concept um, is strengthening the thoracic spine. Is what builds strength in your thoracic musculature that go up and down that, that mid back area is what will help to build bone in the spine and prevent fractures. Can't guarantee that you're gonna build bone, but I can help you build fractures and improve your posture by doing thoracic extension exercises. Sure, and a lot, uh, oh, that's great. And a lot of people, um, you know, the only thing that they see, they might not see, they might not even be familiar with the thoracic spine. They may only know of the lumbar because that's what they've gotten right. bone density results for. So can you talk about the lumbar right. spine a little bit? Yes, um, they do the imaging of the lumbar spine L1 through four only. Just a minute, I'll get the spine. <laughs> and, and for those who are listening on podcast right now, uh, there's also a YouTube version of this where Sherry is actually demonstrating some of this live too. And I'll link to that YouTube video in the show notes. Okay, so here's the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine is differentiated from the thoracic spine by the attachment of ribs. So the lumbar spine does not have rib attachments. There's five vertebrae in the lumbar spine, and then there's 12 in the thoracic for each rib that's attached. T12 has a tiny little rib coming out, and then um, T11 has a little bit longer one that comes out to the side of your waist, and then the rest of the ribs go all the way around, all the way up to your shoulders where T1 sends out a rib around your, right around your collarbones. So, that they can't image, it's just an x-ray, it's a two-dimensional view of your spine. So they can't image through those bones and the ribs get in the way of looking at the bone density. So the only unopposed bones are L1, 2, 3, and 4. And L5 can't be imaged because it's tilted so far down that the sacrum actually covers up some of the bone of the L5 vertebrae. So you'll only get a score for L1, 2, 3, and 4. And the most at risk for fracture are T6, 7, and 8, these mid thoracic. T12 does fracture quite often, but 6, 7, and 8 are where you see the rounded back, that dowager's kind of hump, and the most popular sites for fracture. Once you have one fracture, your risk for having another one adjacent to that fracture site is high. Um, it, it exponentially doubles with each fracture. Um, Two things I would love to share that are so simple to see if you're at risk is if you could stand against the wall and have your head, mid back and sacrum against the wall. If you can keep your eyes forward and have your head against the wall, that's what we call the occiput to wall distance test. If you cannot get your head to the wall because you have stiffness in your back and you're ended up looking up at the ceiling to try to get your, your head back there, then you're at greater risk for fracture. So having your head be able to come back is not necessarily just your neck, it's the upper back mobility that allows you to be able to bring your head back to your body. If someone has more than seven centimeters away from the wall with their occiput to wall distance test, and I can provide you with that resource um, from Antonelli and Calzi. Sure, and I'll, I'll link to this in the show notes as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can let you read that, um, how, to, how to actually do that test. Um, and the, if the head, like I said, is seven centimeters or more away from the wall, it is very likely that the person has had a fracture. So I almost don't even care if they have their bone density scan. Because I already know that someone is at risk for future fractures if they cannot get that head back to the wall and they can't extend their thoracic spine. The other test I want to um, share with you guys is the rib to pelvis distance. Um, I'm going to grab my skeleton. Sure. So, this is so much easier if you can see it on the bones. All right, so Skelly's going to help us out here. And again, for and again for for those of you on on the podcast, there's a, a corresponding video with this, and uh, you can you you'll be able to watch that in the show notes as well. Okay, so skeleton. Every skeleton I've ever seen, drawings, even never drawings, and then regular skeletal models like this have way more space between the ribs and pelvis than there actually is. So if I put my four fingers here in between the ribs and pelvis. It is about five fingers of space between the 10th rib and the pelvis. 
almost no one has that. I think I've seen that maybe twice in my career of 25 years of doing this. So if you put your fingers in between your ribs and pelvis vertically, and you see how many fingers you can get between that 10th rib and the pelvis. If you go right in your axillary line, which is right under your armpit in line with your hip and go up into the, the muffin top test is what some of my patients call it. Um, you stick your finger in there and pull back a little bit. You'll touch that ill, that, I mean that um, 11th rib and it's kind of tickly and it sticks out there. So you want to be just in front of that and you'll feel the 10th rib there. So for me, I have three fingers in between my ribs and pelvis. If I've been sitting all day or if I've been on an airplane, I might have only two. But I did a Pilates class this morning, so I feel lengthened. Um, so I have three fingers. Normal is two to four. Abnormal is one. And I have seen many patients with zero, so that this whole rib cage is sitting right on the pelvis. So if you stick your fingers right into your waistline there and you hit your rib cage, you are very likely, it is very likely that you've had a lumbar fracture. So lumbar means, again, these vertebrae here that are just behind your belly button, just behind L3. So um, the, the L3 is just behind your belly button. And that's how you can tell the small of your back and your middle of your lumbar spine. So I'm hoping those kind of little tests help. I, I teach my Pilates teachers how to do those. I teach um, my yoga teachers how to do those and my colleagues who are physical therapists. Um, we all love for them to do those as well so that they're just super simple, but very telling because they do indicate that people have had fractures even if they haven't had a bone density scan done. Sometimes people can't afford to have a bone density scan done. And um, I don't really need that necessarily to build a program that's safe for somebody. So, so let's say, because sometimes a lot of people are, when they're diagnosed, they may be diagnosed because, not just because, you know, they're, it's a test that their, their doctor wanted to run the DEXA scan because uh, they hit a certain age or a certain time in their life. It may be mm -hmm. because they fractured uh, and they're right. having pain in their back and they've already gone in. Once That's they have right. a fracture, how do you go about developing a safe plan for somebody that has already fractured? Yes. Well, they have to get out of the pain first. So sometimes they're using a Spinomed brace. They might be using some bracing and have to wear a turtle shell sometimes uh, brace, a TLSO is what we call that, and um, make sure that they are healing properly without bending forward. Because as soon as they start to bend forward, the vertebrae tends to get can, tends to get compressed. And so we want to heal with the vertebrae as high as possible and really doing the back extension work, which is counterintuitive for a lot of people. People love to bend forward, it feels really good, but we have to educate people that the front of the spine is what's vulnerable to fracture. So we do backward bending exercises, we do prone extension exercises as much as possible as they're healing to help them strengthen their back and prevent the collapse forward onto that vertebrae. Sanaki did a really interesting study looking at people that had had the kyphoplasty. And what they found was that exercise was actually better than having a kyphoplasty for prevention of future fractures. Could you explain so, what kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty are? Sure. So when you have a complete collapse of a vertebrae, what will happen is you'll either have one of two procedures. One is where they drill into the bone and they insert cement into the bone so that it, it fills up the bone shape. The problem with that is the vertebrae above and below it are next to this hard surface. These are fragile bones next to a cement bone. So they become more at risk for a fracture in a lot of cases, but it's so helpful for people that have pain because about 25% of people that have compression fractures have a lot of pain with them. So if it relieves the pain, great, but they've got to be really vigilant and very, very careful not to do any forward bending exercises. Um, a kyphoplasty is when they do the same procedure. They drill into the bone and then they insert a balloon inside the bone and blow it up. So it blows it up to the normal height, 
and they still insert some cement in there. What I'm hoping they'll do with this procedure is put something besides cement. Maybe they can put some gelatinous substance or something that's not so hard, which will make it a little more successful because there are people that have had adjacent fractures after those procedures. And we try as much as possible to not have people do those procedures unless they are in a lot of pain and need relief from that pain. So when talking about safe movements to, to, Obviously, we want to be avoiding movements that could potentially cause us to fracture or that could cause pain. And we want to be doing movements that, that don't lead to that and actually lead to benefits for our bones. So could you walk through for yoga and Pilates, what are the safe exercises we should absolutely be doing? Obviously, you want to check with someone first to make sure it's right for your body. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also the ones we should absolutely avoid too. Could you talk through those? Sure. Can I get a photograph? Um, sure. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. And then, okay. and then Sherry, so have, as you, as you walk through that photograph, if you could, and, and Sherry's actually referencing a download sheet that is on her website uh, right now that I've actually seen. They're really great. I'll link to those in the show notes, but uh, Sherry, as you're walking through these, could you talk through that so the people on the audio can, can uh, yes. understand which exercises will be good for them too? Yes. Um, I thought a picture would be better. Um, they are, the words are backwards because of the way the iPhone is. <laughs> Sorry about sure. that. Um, so these are my favorite poses for yoga and I'll tell you why. This is the tree pose. I love it for balance and see how lengthened the spine gets and really working on that balance aspect. And then I love half moon pose because it's also a balance exercise, but it's strengthening the legs and really challenging the core to hold that position. So it's quite a challenging exercise or pose. And then there is the triangle pose. That is a nice pose as well, as long as you don't let your spine round during it. My very, very favorite pose is the warrior three, which is right here. This is awesome because it's balance, it's leg strength, and it's back extension. All three of the things that you need to take care of your bones as you, as you deal with the condition of osteoporosis. Um, some of these are really nice for extension of the hip. So this is uh, your warrior two. I, well, I kind of call it warrior 1.5. <laughs> it's a high lunge or runner's lunge, some people call it, uh, runner's high lunge. And then you're really getting that back extension. Both legs are parallel on this one. This is Warrior 2, which I like, but not as much as Warrior 1.5. <laughs> and then I love the chair pose because it's very uh, functional and it teaches people how to keep their spine aligned and targets those back extensors and glutes. Um, then these exercises on the bottom or these poses on the bottom, this is Upward Facing Dog, which is a really great preparation for thoracic extension. But if you're using your hands to push up, you're not so much using your back extensor. So it's very important that you do something like this one, which is like a cobra, and then take your hands off the floor so that you're actually using your back to hold you up instead of pushing into your hands. And then here is what we call sort of a modified locust pose, which I love that one too. So these are my favorites. The ones that you should avoid are gonna be your forward fold with a rounded back. So if you can do the forward fold without rounding your back, you're certainly welcome to do it. Usually I have to get people to bend their knees to do the forward fold. Deep twist with um, excessive assistance with your hands, you wanna avoid that. And then um, this is the one of the pigeon poses and you are trying to stretch your hip and you don't want to force your body weight down on that hip. So if it's easy to do and your hip is on the floor when you do it, then it's, it should be safe. But if you don't have really good hip mobility, what may happen is if your capsule of your hip is really tight, you could have a fracture instead of stretching your capsule. The capsule is quite strong. So if your capsule is stronger than your bone, then you could end up with a little fracture that, that twists through the hip. Um, and then this is warrior one. I don't like this pose because I don't like what it does to the foot and the knee. It puts a lot of strain on the knee and a lot of strain on the foot. And biomechanically, it's almost impossible for people to do very well if they're not very mobile in their hips. And lastly, I suggest that people avoid overpressure from their teachers 
and don't allow, you know, adjustments are fine or corrections are fine, but no overpressure, very strong overpressure. And what is overpressure for those who don't know? That just means when the teacher is pressing hard on your body or pushing you down. So encouraging touching is fine, but pushing on someone's body when they have low bone density is probably not a good idea. Um, there is something else I wanted to, yeah. So the other poses that I definitely want people to avoid are the shoulder stand and the plow. That is a huge amount of load on the thoracic spine. So you don't want to do anything where you are balancing on your thoracic spine and your body is over those bones. You can see how that could be very compressive. So that's something I want people to avoid. Oh, those are, those are all great. And, and like I said, for those who are listening to the podcast, obviously you couldn't see the visuals that the cherry was pointing out, um, but we will link to the, the PDFs for those in the show notes so you can see which ones to avoid, uh, which ones are safe and recommended by, by Sherry. And it, that's going to be really helpful for you as, as you're getting started with this. So we've talked about injury prevention. Could you talk about um, how does physical therapy specifically tie into osteoporosis? Well, we can see people as a wellness visit and help them with um, putting together a safe exercise program if they're trying to prevent osteoporosis. If they actually have osteoporosis and they have a fracture or any kind of pain or underlying condition, we can see them and help them treat the pain safely. And then along with that, teach them exercises that are gonna be safe for osteoporosis. Um, helping them deal with the injury that they have because sometimes people are told, oh yeah, bend your knees towards your chest and round your back because your back hurts. Well, that would be um, problematic for somebody that has osteoporosis. So for example, someone comes in with stenosis and they have osteoporosis. Well, stenosis, we tell people to round forward and with osteoporosis, we tell them to bend back. So we teach them ways that they can deal with both of those conditions and be safe not causing a pinched nerve from the stenosis and not causing a fracture for osteoporosis. So there's always those conundrums that we're trying to deal with with our patients. And what about for scoliosis? Because I do have, you know, I have some clients and community members that I know have scoliosis as well. What are some of the things that are done there also in conjunction with osteoporosis? Yes. Um, when someone has scoliosis, they are at greater risk for osteoporosis. And there's also that greater risk of collapse with the, with the side bending curves. So all of those, I love the Schroff technique where you're lengthening up and stretching and using a lot of axial elongation techniques for decompressing the spine is excellent for osteoporosis as well. So usually someone that specializes in the, the Schroff um, scoliosis technique um, would be a, a great resource for you and your community. If you can't find someone that specializes specifically in osteoporosis, um, you can find someone that also works with that technique, the Schroth technique. And is there a database or something like that where they can look that up and find someone local to their area that does that? Yes, you can just look up Schroth scoliosis and um, I'm so sorry, I don't remember the exact website, but, but if you enter, if you Google Schroth scoliosis, um, and then after the podcast, I'll look that up for you and give you that resource so you can stick that okay, great. on the section or great. on the video. Yeah. Well, so I, uh, I, I want to just, uh, I, I know we're, we're closing in on, on our time together here, but um, any other important things that you think would be important to discuss? I, I know we talked a lot about physical therapy, exercises you should do and shouldn't do, um, yoga, Pilates. Maybe we could talk a little bit about what are the benefits of doing this for their bones specifically? What have you seen clinically? What does some of the research say out there? And uh, anything else that you think would be important to share? Yeah. Okay. So I, I realized that I didn't talk about Pilates exercises. Great. So I'm looking at mostly Pilates mat work. I'm not talking so much about apparatus here. And um, this is one of my favorite exercises uh, for building um, strength in the core and abdominals. And um, it's safe for people with osteoporosis. It's called single leg kick. Push-ups I love. And then here, this is a side lift exercise. Some people call it side plank, but it's actually 
technically called side bend in Pilates. And um, I love that one for strengthening shoulder, torso, hip, knee, ankle. It's just a multi-purpose exercise. Um, also the shoulder bridge with, um, usually it's done with a straight leg, but this is a modified version here called shoulder bridge and where the leg is pumping up and down. And then here is leg pull, which is a very hard exercise, but great for uh, targeting the hips and the spine as well. And here is the swan, looks a lot like cobra in yoga. And then double leg kick is also looks a lot like locust in yoga. And swimming is one of my favorite exercises from the mat work. It is incorporating hip extension and thoracic extension, and it's quite challenging for the upper back and the, the thoracolumbar musculature. So you're building bone and muscle strength there. Um, Sanaki did some great research or really some chart reviews on people that did extension exercises much like these and saw that they had a lot less fractures in the people that practiced extension and greater numbers of fractures in people that practice flexion exercises. I've so seen I think those. that's really important. Yeah. And I know I'm, I was kind of backtracking from the other uh, conversation we were having and I didn't say anything about the Pilates method. Um, but yeah, the main points, a um, couple of things I'd love to share is that um, water exercise has been a little controversial and does not generally build bone. What we see in water polo players and swimmers is that they actually lose bone density during the season in their spine and hip, and they might gain bone density in their arms where they're out of the water. Um, so water, water exercise is not recommended for people with osteoporosis. It's fine to start a water program if you have arthritis and you want to try to get to start to start to get to feeling better and uh, just feeling like less pain and easier to move and just segue quickly out of that water program and get onto land. We need land-based exercises to promote bone health. Walking does not build bone unless you have been very sick or sedentary. So if that's the only exercise you've done in years and it's taxing to you to go out for a walk, then that's perfect. That would be fine. You will probably see some bone building benefits from walking. But if you're already exercising and walking and you think that walking is going to help, putting weights on yourself or using weighted vests while you walk, nah, that's endurance exercise. That's not so great for building bone in the spine or the hip. And um, it's good for maintaining your bone health and good for your longevity and well-being, your cardiovascular system. You definitely need exercises for your cardiovascular system, but they are not the same as exercises for bone health. Strengthening, strength training builds bone and muscle strength. And then endurance exercises are for your heart. So you need to be doing your cardiovascular fitness three times a week and then your bone strengthening, muscle strengthening, leg strengthening, fitness uh, three times a week. Uh, that would be your goal is to do it, especially during this quarantine time, it would be great to focus on that. And let's see if we can get stronger at the end of this instead of decline. There's no reason to decline right now, especially if you're not working. I know that some people have children at home and you know, getting your kids involved would be great. They need more activity and exercise. So um, I know it's tough for families that are stuck all together at home and maybe driving each other crazy a little bit. Um, but yeah, those are some of my favorite recommendations to give people and inspire them to uh, move forward with that. I've definitely seen bone health benefits. I've seen people gain 15% in one year. I've seen 8%, 6%. I've seen 2% at times, which is great. If you're over 50 and you're gaining 2% in your bones, bones, density from your uh, spine or your hip, that's actually excellent because you're supposed to decline at 1% per year after age 50. So if you even stay the same or just build one, maybe 2%, don't, don't poo poo that. That's great. Um, that's excellent to build anything at this time of your life. So don't be discouraged about it. If you're taking some medications that may be detrimental like cortisone, things like that. You just want to try to keep strong, keep doing your fracture prevention things and keep at it because the things that you do to help your posture, help your form and alignment as you're doing activities of daily living and exercise is going to help you prevent fractures, even if you don't build bone density. So don't make it all about just building bone density, get stronger, 
You can always do that. And then really practice awareness and alignment of your body and get better at that. Oh, I, I love that, Sherry. And I think that's a, that's a really good note to, uh, to end on. And, and what I do want to end with is actually uh, where, where can my audience find, find you, your work? Um, what are the resources that you've got available that are out there? And, and we can absolutely link to those in the show notes as well. Okay. So the first resource is therapilates.com that has a lot of information on osteoporosis. It's a website I've been working on for about 20 years. It's based around my clinic in California. And my mother um, was getting older and it was kind of time for me to transition to working with her more closely and helping her as she ages. She's doing great, but she's actually doing better since I've been here because she's taking classes and exercising more. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she's, She's now regretting me coming here because <laughs> she was excited at first and uh, no, I think she's still excited. But, um, but anyway, and then I have a clinic in, Cal in Monroe, Louisiana, where my mom lives and um, it's called Sherry Betts, uh, drsherrybetts.com and you can get um, information there on my local practice if you want to work with me um, you know, virtually on a one-to-one -one session doing consultations, I do those through that website. And it's HIPAA compliant uh, software that we use to work with people, so it's private. And um, that's called, again, drsherrybetts.com. The free resources that I love to recommend for you are the um, American Bone Health website. It's just AmericanBoneHealth.org. There's a lot of great consumer outreach and resources there. I have a lot of videos there and I do some of the training programs for the volunteers that are speakers. And then um, National Osteoporosis Foundation. I'm the liaison for the American Physical Therapy Association and the NOF. There's wonderful resources there for both clinicians and consumers. And, um, and the American Physical Therapy Association has a wonderful um, tool called choosept.com and that's where you can find a PT locally that is a um, board certified geriatric specialist. Those are the people that have been trained in working with people with osteoporosis. It's under that geriatrics umbrella. Even if you're not a geriatric, that's where you would go to get information about osteoporosis. And um, then um, the last one is Osteoporosis Canada. And I think they do a wonderful job. They have some great videos and great resources that are free, wonderful booklets and video vignettes about different cases. And Laura John Gregorio has done an excellent job of leading that research team. And like I said, it's a lot. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping it's good because th these are resources that are going to be very helpful and they are nonprofit organizations. They have free information for you. They're not trying to sell you anything. I just want you to be able to use your household tools that you have at home to be able to help your health and not have to buy a product. I don't want to sell any products to you. I think you've got everything you need in your own home to be able to get healthy. So um, if you need anything else, absolutely uh, feel free to ask. One more um, link is uh, PilatesAnytime.com offers a free 30-day uh, trial if uh, you enter the, the letters S bets, S B E T Z, you can enter that and get a free 30 day trial with um, all of their resources on there. So I have a lot of classes on equipment and off equipment, and that classes, things like that, are on there as well. So awesome. I that think is, those are all of them. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, <anybody>. that's amazing. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this information, your knowledge, your expertise, everything you've learned in, in your career with our audience today. And I just want to say thank you very much, Dr. Betts, for coming on the show. Well, thank you, Kevin. And I'm so excited that a young male is interested in sharing information about osteoporosis. This is a pediatric condition with geriatric manifestations. This is for young people to take care of their bones now so that they don't have these problems in the future. We build all of our bone, about 95% of our bone that we're ever going to have by age 20. So we need to be thinking about that when we're young. So thank you, Kevin. I'm so Absolutely. excited to help you. Absolutely. And it's my pleasure. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you. Bye Thanks. Bye. 
Hey, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Bone Coach Show with Dr. Sherry Betts. She covered so much information on safe exercise, yoga, Pilates, how those can fit into your osteoporosis plan. If you know somebody who could benefit from this information, whether that be an aunt, a mother, a close friend, maybe a group of people, share this information with them so they can get the help that they need. If you found something helpful, you learned something new, hit that like button, comment below. I'd love to hear from you. And then also... There are some great resources that I've linked to right below this video, and that one of them being my, my free Stronger Bones Masterclass training that walks you through the three-step blueprint, the three simple steps I use to help people go from being worried about fracture, you know, not knowing what to do, not having a plan in place to knowing exactly what to do and when how to take charge of their bone health, and how to start building stronger bones. So it's definitely a training that you want to check out. I think that's it for this one. I'm your bone coach, Kevin Ellis. See you in the next episode.